And it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce the next speaker is Leslie Weiland. And he received the Nevanlina Prize in 1986 for his work on complexity theory, in particular for finding problems which are easy to show solutions, but to count the solutions is very difficult. And later in 2010, he received also the Turing Award uh, for his, partly because of his work on uh, approximately uh, um, correct um, uh, search, uh, learning problems. And now he will talk about uh, where computer science meets neuroscience, and we're looking forward to this interesting topic. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to be uh, uh, here again, and I do have to again thank the organizers for making this possible for all of us. Um, so as the title suggests, uh, I'm really interested in the, in, the real, in the brain, in the real brain, and I'm also interested in explanations which computer science offers, uh, algorithms, uh, con concrete explanations of states, change of states, the next step. So in some sense, while many have remarked here that the boundaries between uh, mathematics and, com and computer science are pretty hard to discern now, so I'm hoping in the future the boundaries between biology and computer science will be hard to discern also, because once one gets uh, mechanistic explanations to the precision of algorithms, then the two are, uh, are the same field. So just to um, position what I'm going to say, so I'll start by saying what I'm not going to say. Um, so this talk uh, isn't about machine learning or, induct or inductive learning. And uh, that's not because I don't think that's a good field. I think the question of inductive learning is a secret of many things, and I have worked a lot on that. Uh, but in fact, uh, when I, while working on that, I thought that uh, I would have some advantage to understanding how the brain works. But then when I started to think about the brain, I discovered that it wasn't very helpful because uh, there are some much more basic unresolved problems about the brain than, than that. So there are things about the brain which are so simple that uh, no uh, theories of, of generalization uh, can help you. And to be specific, um, so we've all come here and we've all met some new people. Uh, so the question is, uh, how have our brains changed to memorize these new people we've met? So maybe you'll remember five people from here. But for each person, will you assign uh, one neuron or 10 neurons or 10 million neurons? And uh, so amazingly, uh, no one has the, un the foggiest uh, answer to this question. So I think one neuron, a few people believe it's one neuron. But uh, it, it could be anywhere uh, otherwise in, in that range. And it's kind of rather astonishing state of, of ignorance. Um, so. Uh, I suppose summarizing my talk very simply, so the most obvious fact about the brain, which is different from other devices we have, is that as far as we know, it's got no addressing. So in a computer, you can go to address seven. Apparently on the internet, you can also go to address seven. But as far as we know, in the brain, there's no such thing. So uh, how do we store things? And of course, that's compounded with the fact that the brain does many more things than just memorize. And I'll, I'll go through that. And, uh, so to make a scientific problem out of this, we have to, or I, I try to make a, a maximally complex problem out of it, something which is difficult to realize and, and show that that constrains what the solutions may be. Um, and of course, the, um, when I say how do we memorize the five people we will remember from here, uh, the pro problem I'm really implying is that you know, every week uh, for, for the, all your life, you've got this capability, we can keep putting more memories in our brains, and uh, there's some interference with previous memories, but the amazing thing is that it's uh, not that bad. Uh, so just the quantity of, uh, of information which we can realize in a certain way is what, how we build that constrained system. So just more broadly, um, so what impresses me about uh, the human brain? So what impresses me is symbolic processing. So I can tell you a story. I know what green means, I mean, I know what fox means, 
So now I tell you that in a certain place there's a restaurant called the Green Fox. So you, you can handle this information. Um, I went there, it was a bad choice. Okay, so you can handle this information too. It was recommended by Joe. Um, I, I was there when I heard the election results. So I can go and carry on telling you a long story of relationships and facts and combinations, and you can recall this in your brain uh, for a lifetime. Um, so this is what I'll kind of make into the um, difficult task, which we have to explain. And of course, uh, psychologists have studied this also, as we heard earlier in the week. So the idea of chunking is important for psychologists, which is the idea that uh, you can combine uh, two things into, into a more complex thing, and the, the more complex things becomes as simple as the original simple things. So, for example, in mathematics, we learn more and more complicated definitions. They pile up on, it, uh, uh, on each other. But at the end, if you're an expert, then the compound the definition becomes as simple for you as the original ones. So that's a very basic fact of, of cognition. Um, and uh, so as I said, what's impressive is not that you can do this once, but you can do this for hundreds of thousands of such tasks. Um, and basically, there's no theory of this, uh, which even in principle is, everyone explains, uh, is right. So if there's anyone here looking for big open problems, uh, there are big open problems here. <laughs> okay. So, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe to you my, my journey through this uh, uh, space. So I'll just describe seven requirements, which are my general description of what we do in cognitive uh, processes uh, we have to acknowledge. So one is that we can do one-shot learning. I say something once to you, you remember it. It's not like typical machine learning where you have to retrain a million times. We have to account for that. We can do large number of tasks. Not quite clear what number that should be. Maybe it should be 10 to the 6. I'm not sure. Um, so a um, bit more uh, technical. Um, so what is learning a task? Um, so a typical task would be like an association. Um, and so what I am working towards is the idea that it's not that you store some information and then when you use it, some processor comes along and interprets it, but that uh, just for efficiency, uh, you'll modify a part of your brain to make a sub-circuit which, which does, does something um, efficiently. Um, so, um, and one requirement is that the sub-circuits should be able to compose themselves kind of on the fly. That if you give me a name of someone, I can form an association and then make a deductive association in a very, very fast chain of associations and react uh, fast. Um, so in some sense, um, to relate this to Manuel's talk, um, so there's always, uh, in any theory of cognition, uh, there's a kind of a, a mind's eye, the stage, and then there's the rest. And so these sub-circuits would be in the rest, and I'm not only interested in some general uh, Turing machine-like theory, I want to, I'm interested in how the brain actually works, and so I have to be pretty efficient. So the sub-circuits will live in the rest, so it can, it, it can communicate with your mind's eye, your working memory, efficiently enough. Okay, um, so main thing is this will be quantitative, that um, we are short of uh, resources in our heads. Uh, we have a finite number of neurons, finite number of connections, and the connection strengths, which I'll come to, are also very important. And these are all precious, they take up volume, and we have to account for why uh, quantitatively uh, we have enough for what we need. Um, also, there's some architecture involved, so one very simple issue is that the connections in your brain, the axons, are one, are one directional. So our theory has to respect that. And uh, lastly, um, so much uh, work traditionally in this theoretical neuroscience area has been to study uh, one task at a time. Um, so these, for, for example, these hot pill nets, they address one particular task. Um, so here I'm interested in trying to address uh, a set of tasks which among them may possibly form a basis for building higher level cognitive functions. So just doing one task and not explaining why that leads anywhere is somehow uh, not enough. So I'll say more, more about that. Um, okay, so just to uh, summarize quickly what we have to know about the brain. So there's no addressing mechanism. 
it's slow, maybe it, uh, in 100 steps you can do amazing things. It's sparsely connected, most neurons, well, every, all neurons are connected to a small fraction of the others. Um, but there are some simplifications, so long distance com communication is very stylized, so there's something very simple, essentially it's one kind of communication, these spikes. Um, and what I'll deal with are quantitative resources, so I think I'll, I'll need four parameters, n is the number of neurons, d is the average connections from each neuron to every other, um, it, I'll have random graphs. Uh, the third uh, physical parameter is the strength of the synapse, and so I'll come back to that. Okay, okay, so th this is it. So uh, the, there's some things we don't know about the brain, and these will be parameters for me. And the most important uh, for me, which I don't know, is how strong synapses are. So how strong an influence does one neuron have on another? Um, so for example, if we could have a very, very democratic society where for any neuron to do something, 10,000 others would have to agree and contribute a little bit, or it could be much more Boolean where one neuron can tell the other what, what to do. Um, so K is this parameter. Um, so if K is large, then that means that you, you, if the K is 100, that means that you want 100 uh, neurons to be active before the neuron they're connected to is made active. Whereas K equals 1 is a very Boolean world which, uh, where a single neuron has a very strong synapse. Uh, a neuron can fire because of a single neuron causing it to fire. And in general, uh, strong neurons are more powerful than weak ones, as we'd expect. And no doubt, throughout the brain, the different... In the brain, there's also a variety of things going on. So there isn't a single measurement we can, anyone can take which gives all the answers. Um, just two other comments. Um, so many biologists emphasize that there are many different kinds of neurons and even of synapses. And so my interpretation is simply that these are all executing the different algorithms and they're necessary. Um, but this also implies that it's a bit naive to say that, you know, ask the biologists what the real neuron is like, because the answer is that they come in all kinds of variety, and for good reason. Um, and then the other comment is that um, because of the sparse connections and on the average weak synapses, the brain is communication challenged, like most prior computers. Um, and for that reason, that's the real uh, um, obstacle we have to fight against. And the advantage of that is that the actual computational power at the neurons isn't so critical. So we, we don't have to be, understand that fully um, before we can uh, make some conclusions. So even if you put a, a supercomputer at each, instead of each of your neurons, your brain will still be very limited because of the, of the sparse connections. Okay, uh, so as far as the general uh, um, strategy, um, so again, I'm saying this is a problem, it's, it's not a problem where there are thousands of competing theories, and we just have to figure out which one is right. It's a problem where there's no viable theories, so how do we proceed? Okay, so I've got this model, I'll just sketch it. It'll underestimate the power of the brain, so I don't want anyone to complain that the brain is, can't do this. If the brain can do more, that's fine. Um, I do want it to do several tasks, so it's like a, you know, between them they should account for a possible basis of cognition. Um, I want to show that this simple model can execute my interesting tasks. And to make it quantitative, I really emphasize that uh, um, um, that I want to show that uh, this model can execute large numbers of these tasks in succession. So just doing a single memorization should, does, doesn't and shouldn't impress anyone but doing uh, numbers comp comparable to what humans can do, then maybe that should. Okay, so uh, this is what I'm interested in. Okay, so now I have to describe to you some tasks. So what are interesting tasks? Um, so I've got two basic tasks I want to describe today. So first, there has to be a task which uh, assigns storage. How do you put a new item in? How do you store your new friend? Um, so who's your new friend? Um, so the first time you heard of Donald Trump, I'm using this only because I expect most of you have heard of him. Um, so, so what happens? Okay, so, so this will be an instance of hierarchical memorization, and it will have a definition. And the definition is that um, 
you assume that you've already got two items, and they could be parts of his name, so maybe you already have heard of the word Donald and Trump, or it could be parts of his appearance, it could be anything, it just depends the first time you, you memorized uh, this concept, you know, depends uh, what you are doing. But so let's suppose A is Donald and B is Trump. Um, then the task which your brain has to do is to allocate neurons to a new item C, which will be this uh, Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, you'll change some synaptic weights so that in the future, when uh, A and B will, are both active, then it will cause C to be active also. So you have to find some, some storage for C. So this is again chunking. And you, have to be able, and you have to have some operational capability that in the future, under what conditions do you wake up um, the C, it's when you fire A and B. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a definition. Um, okay, so this is just reflects what psychologists call chunking. Um, so, um, so here I haven't, it seems I haven't assumed anything. Um, about the brain, but I have, and the basic assumption is that there's some discreteness. So I'm associating a concept like Donald with a set of neurons. So this is in contrast with some, some sort of holographic representation across the brain which, where you can't locate it. Um, so that's an assumption of the model. So there is some uh, evidence for, um, for this. So these are some famous experiments done which, which became feasible about 15 years ago. These are done on humans with uh, electrodes in certain parts of the brain, the hippocampus, and these patients had electrodes in certain neurons, and they were shown pictures on a laptop, and they were shown lots of pictures, some, several of which were of uh, uh, Bill Clinton. And this particular, um, so this shows that this neuron, I think the, these uh, columns are the responses, electrical responses of this one particular neuron. It's a one second interval. Um, and so it turned out that this, this is all for the same neuron, all the pictures, all the uh, parts of this thing are for the same neuron, the patient being seen in different pictures, and this neuron, whenever it was shown Bill Clinton in various positions, um, sometimes even just his name, it responded rather heavily, whereas if shown uh, different things like different American presidents or something dissimilar, it, it didn't. Okay, so this is some evidence of locality. Uh, what's surprising is that these uh, were fairly surprisingly easy to find. So the rough calculation is that maybe in this part of the cortex, if you were looking for Bill Clinton cells, there may be one in a thousand were Bill Clinton cells. Of course, this, these results have to be treated with caution because if you poke around in a computer, um, most likely when you see activity, it's not where the object is stored, but some information in transit. But, it, but there's very strong evidence that this discreteness uh, is, um, is, is a characteristic of cortex. So the other uh, relationship I want to deal with is, uh, is so once you've assigned uh, neurons to your various concepts, then you want to describe relationships. So in, in this task, with no, no allocation of, of new neurons, you just... Uh, um, form relationships be, be, between them. So this will be the task of association. And um, again, in my definition for an association, uh, you already uh, know a concept of Donald Trump. If you have a concept of elected president, he's already exists in your brain, but you want to change your brain so that in the future, when you think of Donald Trump, you know he's been elected president. Again, similar definition. You've got two sets of neurons representing this and this and you want to change the weight so that uh, whenever this is active, you'll be reminded that he's, he's president, okay? Um, so this second task has a, does have a long history. So Will Shaw, back in the 60s, investigated nets with this particular kind of association. So the word association is used in 100 different senses. Uh, this is a very particular one, and it's the same as, uh, as Will Shaw. Um, so, so um, okay, so, um, so I do need a model. Um, so very roughly, it's like a, you can start off with McCullough Pitts in 1943, but you want to make it more programmable, expressing timing and, and things like that. And uh, so, you know, I do have a model where, you know, these numbers are important to me, 
numbers of neurons, strength of synapses, and uh, one makes li you know, light decisions about what can depend on, on what. Okay, I do have a model. I won't uh, um, spend more time on that. Um, so the fourth parameter in this is this uh, is how many neurons are used for my friend at uh, HLF, and I call that R. And uh, and in general, um, of course, um, with uh, with Bill Clinton, the idea that you can easily find a neuron which corresponds to Bill Clinton, at least a certain part of the brain, means that in that part of the brain R is large. So R could be a million, ten million. If R were ten you wouldn't find um, the Bill Clinton cell. Um, and then the uh, other issue is, you know, are the Bill Clinton cells really disjoint from the uh, George Bush cells? So that would be disjoint, or are they shared? So there's a lot of evidence, at least from this, these kind of measurements, is that they're shared, that there are neurons which respond to Bill Clinton and the Eiffel Tower. So it's like, almost like random sets for each concept which overlap randomly. Okay, so, uh, so basically I've, I've told you everything that uh, needs to be said. Um, so, uh, so I've got a task like association. Um, I've got, you're born with a brain. You've got a certain number of neurons, a certain number of connections. And I do assume that the connections are random. One can say more about what kind of random. And then uh, we've got... Um, you know, our parameters, we've got random graph, n neurons, a probability of an edge being present. Um, we're going to devote a set of R neurons to uh, Donald Trump and to elected president. And then we've got this uh, synaptic strength. And then this, this defines what, what the brain needs to do, because what the brain needs to do at least is that when this set of neurons fire, then you want all of these to fire. And what this means is that uh, each of the target neurons has to have at least uh, k connections to the to these neurons. Okay, so of course this is a sparse graph. So the a could be a million, the b, the c could be a million, k could be twenty, um, and all that means is that uh, for this cell um, there should be at least twenty connections uh, from the million Donald Trump uh, neurons. Okay, so. Uh, so these four, you've got a random graph with four parameters, and uh, there are some relationships uh, which permit this kind of uh, task to be completed. Um, so the main uh, constraint here is that the random graph should, should support the capability you want. Actually changing the weights of the synapses to do the right thing, uh, that's uh, usually easy. Um, so that's, that's one task. And you can analyze it. You know, you don't have to, to do very much. Uh, so this is a Bernoulli distribution. Uh, you have to know how random graphs work. The difficulty in the analysis is that I mean, if you just had one task to do, then you're born with your fresh random brain, and um, uh, you can exploit the randomness to do whatever you like with high probability. But once you've memorized 10,000 different things, then it's not random anymore. There's lots of dependencies and, and proving that uh, your brain can still do, th do this large number of things even when it's got these previous memories um, is, uh, um, is what gets challenging. So the philosophy is you're born with your random network and then you've got these experiences which are arbitrary. So you have to be able to memorize and deal with cognitive concepts which the world throws at you. So it's a kind of a worst case kind of worst case uh, world, uh, which your initial random graph has to be, has to be able to face. Um, okay, so, um, and hierarchical memorization, again, it's a very similar uh, graph theory problem, it's just uh, different details. Um, okay, so the actual conditions are a bit more complex than I've, so the difficulties are that, um, well, you know, when do you declare a, a cell to be a Bill Clinton cell? Uh, to make this kind of th theory work, um, you have to ensure the system where, um, right, so, so, uh, so when 95% of my Bill Clinton cells fire, I'll say, you're thinking of Bill Clinton, when less than 
then you're, you're not thinking of Bill Clinton. And I want to make sure the whole system is such that you're never in between. In, in between. So the system has some um, polarity that um, you, know, you, you know when you're, which concept you're, you're representing. Okay, and it's the big ran it's a random phenomena of large numbers of random events which ma makes that possible. Um, so one way of investigating this is by computer simulations. In fact, that's a better one if you know the parameters because you get exact answers. It's a random graph, so you just do lots of experiments. So th this we did some years ago with Vitaly Feldman, um, and we found that um, okay, so we had several operations, including the two which I mentioned. Um, and we fired these operations at this random graph and figured out um, at what capacity did it, did it fill up. Okay, so eventually, um, eventually, as you add more and more associations and other tasks, the thing breaks down. Okay, you start forgetting your earlier memories. Um, okay, so one, we had two regimes. I'll quickly mention that way it worked. So we had systems with, with um, could be a small part of, of your brain, brain with uh, 10 to the 8 neurons, number of connections uh, per neuron, which is kind of realistic uh, in some animals. So K, as I said, K is a parameter. Different parts of the brain may use different Ks. Um, and uh, for these three numbers, we found that, in fact, the number of neurons you have to use to allocate a concept was 360,000. So it's a pretty big fraction of the 100 million. And then we could support about 3,000 of these actions before behavior was, went subpar for our uh, requirements. Um, okay. And another regime is, uh, is better. And with this other regime, we used, uh, the main thing is we used strong synapses. And then we could do more human like uh, performance. Um, okay. Okay, so the basic uh, difference between the two regimes was that the first regime was just, as I said, the, you only looked at direct connections, whereas the regime where you had a higher capacity, you had an uh, intermediate uh, set of neurons, uh, such that the weights of these neurons were large. Okay, so not, yes, 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 yes a, a small k of these neurons. So these are the things. So these are two regimes which where you could do useful things in, with parameters which the brain may have, and this was subject, subject of investigation. And you can also prove uh, some theorems. Um, so if you want uh, at least a second of a definition. So you can prove So an association is that when this set fires, you want this set to fire. And when this set fires, you want this set to fire. So C is the capacity. Maybe C is 100,000. and uh, the more exact definition is that, yes, when XI fires, you want all of YI to fire, uh, but you want very little noise. You, you want about zero of the other neurons to fire. Okay, so besides the, your positive intention, you also want to make sure that there are no, uh, no mistakes. And you can ask questions about um, what the capacity is, and you can prove theorems which track how, how, um, how close you can get to various uh, ideal capacities. And one can do quite uh, tight analysis, at least uh, asymptotically. OK, so I won't give you the details of that. Um, but I'll just finish by saying that uh, what's special now is that there's some hope on the horizon that some of these theories can be tested. And uh, the kind of experiments which would test it, uh, I'd like to call in-circuit testing which I think is some old-fashioned word from electrical engineering, where you've got some old-fashioned circuit board, and you put probes on, on, on the different components to, to test the thing locally, as opposed to testing the whole board as input-output. Um, OK, so what this would mean is that you know, you've got some animal. And what the hypothesis says is that, is that if, you, um, if you put uh, electrode into some random set of of the right number of neurons, to another random set of another right number of neurons, then if your brain has the capacity to do associations, then by some sort of protocol of firing this set and firing this set, you can teach it so that in the future, whenever you fire just these, then these will fire. Okay, so this is a possible 
training thing you could do on, a, on, a, on an animal. Um, so, uh, so it's a bit strange for, for neuroscientists because neuroscientists like experiments where there's some natural input or natural output. Um, but you know that, that com that's confusing. I want to do, do the simplest thing like this. And there's also some technical difficulties, like uh, for these neurons, you're, when you're training and testing, you're both stimulating them and recording from them. And that's quite kind of state of the art. Uh, so these experiments are kind of uh, just becoming feasible. So some chance of figuring out uh, whether this capability uh, um, brains have. Of course, there are quite a few parameters we don't know, like we don't know how big R is. So if R is a million, it may be difficult to test pairs of millions of, of, of neurons. OK. Um, OK, so, um, so again, just to, so, okay, so just to finish, uh, so thank you. Um, but uh, OK, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs>